Hello, everybody. Uh, this, this afternoon I was uh, working in this theater with the te technician of the Vrij of Frans. And it was a bit chilly here and he said, well, I wish we had a Honeywell wheel in this theater so we can adjust the temperature. And uh, he provided me with a brilliant metaphor, I think, for this evening. Because climate engineering is actually looking for a Honeywell wheel for the, for the whole planet. Just to be able to reduce the temperature, just to lower the temperature because things are, are heating up. Um, a fascinating topic, I think. Uh, the planet is heating up. Engineers and scientists are researching methods to cool the planet down. Uh, Hermann Ruschenberg will explain different methods to do it. Um, we have um, a lot of questions, of course, in this respect. Um, the first thing, is it a wise thing to do, to tinker with our planet? Um, and if we decide to do that, who, I who is going to do it? So that's a very relevant question. Um, who is responsible when things go wrong? So there are a lot of, lot of questions. I'm very happy that we have three experts in the field. I will introduce the three of you uh, in one uh, stroke and then we uh, give the floor to you. We start with Professor Herman Ruschenberg. He's a full professor uh, in atmospheric uh, remote sensing at the TU Delft and director of the TU Delft Climate Institute. And Herman will discuss several techniques of climate engineering. Then we have Professor Frank Biermann, who just rushed into this theater. Very welcome, Frank, also. Uh, full professor of global sustainability governance at the <laughs> University of Utrecht. Um, and Frank will shed light on the political implications. Um, how can climate engineering be organized in a de democratic uh, and fair way, if at all? That's the, the main question which we address to, uh, to Frank. And then last but not least, Patrick Smith. Uh, he's a philosopher, assistant professor uh, at the University of Twente. And he will be reflecting on the ethical issues regarding climate engineering. Um, is it ethical with respect to future generations, for instance, to mm. tinker with our clim climate? Um, or is it unethical not to do so? That's also, we can do nothing, but then things might go wrong. So a lot of very intriguing questions, varying from, from more technical, um, few political and, and philosophical ethical. Okay, I stop talking. The floor is yours. We start with Herman Ruschenberg. Please, Herman. Yes. Come here, a big hand for Herman, all the way from Delft. Oh, good evening, oh, my name is uh, Herman Russenberg. I'm uh, from Delft University and I'm uh, uh, an atmospheric scientist and I'm a climate scientist. And what I do in Delft is, uh, well, we, we study the climate system and we try to understand all the mechanisms behind climate change and use this information also to make uh, proje projections of what might happen in the future. So this talk, uh, first, before I go into climate engineering, uh, not Honey Honeywell, I'm not such so, so a fan of Honeywell, let's take another brand. Uh, let's, so why do we need, or why might we need climate engineering? Well, this is, uh, I think, a uh, very illustrative graph of what has happened in the past so far. Here we see the concentration of CO2 from 280, this is the pre-industrial level, until for 10 more or less, that's the current level of CO2. And here we have the temperature anomaly. So how much does the temperature deviate from the long-term uh, mean? And what you see along this line uh, are points with the years in there of the, of the concentration of CO2 versus the temperature anomaly. Along this line, you can see very nicely that with increasing CO2, you get an increasing temperature. And also the years over here, you can see the, yeah, the early uh, 20th century, we were here, and as time progresses, we end up here. So this is a very nice illustration of the, at least the correlation between CO2 and temperature increase. Here we have the same thing, but then as a function of time. So since 1880, the, the global mean temperature as a function of time and how it increases. And last year, 2019, was the, the second warmest year in at least in this time record. So <coughs> we try to put it, put it into models, and then you get the question, because models are used for policy making, how good are the models? Well, this is a an, uh, an comparison between uh, uh, real uh, measurements of temperatures, function of time, and model forecasts and predictions uh, as for the same period. 
And what you see is a pretty good agreement between the dashed line over here and the temperature uh, measurements themselves. But it tells us that the climate knowledge, as we have it right now, is quite good in understanding the global trends. It's not good enough yet in, the, in predicting or say something about the regional or local climate, but in the global trend, the global mean, they are pretty good. So using such models, <coughs> uh, well, we can then say, okay, what might happen in the future with the temperature if we assume certain what we call scenarios. So scenario is just, go ahead. If you make assumptions about future emissions of CO2, and of course this is linked to many things, economical growth, uh, growth of the population, uh, all these things come into play, and policy making, how do you deal with the, the CO2 emissions. And then using these assumptions, you can say, well, use your climate model, first predict the past, so how well can you reconstruct the past measurements, if that's done well enough, you can say, well, go ahead and say something about the future. And then you have the red line over here, which is an extreme uh, scenario. You say, well, if, if basically it means if you do not, don't do that much on climate policy, you follow the red line, and then by the end of the century, you might end up with four to five degrees warming. If you say, what well, is the blue line over here? Well, be very active. So reduce emissions as fast as you can. So bring it down to zero almost now. Then you end this blue line over here, and you end up with one one and a half degrees by the end of the century. And in Paris, we said, well, we want to stay below two degrees. That is a target of Paris. But preferably below one and a half degree, this line over here. And then you can pretty soon see, depending on which scenario you choose, so depending on the policy that you design for yourself for future emissions, when you will cross the line. And you can also see that to remain below one and a half <coughs> degrees, you really have to follow very drastic climate policies and reduction of CO2. Uh, using these models, you can say, okay, uh, if two degrees is the target, uh, how much CO2 can I burn before, or put in the atmosphere, so how much coal or oil can I burn and put in the atmosphere before I get this? So you take the world of 1750, the pre-industrial world, you calculate the temperature, you say how much CO2 should I put into the atmosphere before I get to the Paris limit. You get something like this. This is the total amount of CO2 that you can spend before you reach the two degrees, starting from zero. And these three green bars is what we have used up so far. And this tiny bar over here of 800 gigatons is what we still have. So this is the challenge. So if you want to stay below two degrees in a world of a growing economy, a growing population and a growing standard of living, this is the amount of CO2, the reservoir of CO2 we still have left in our ener energy uh, uh, supply. This four years ago, yeah. And time is going fast. I don't want to depress you too much, <laughs> but this shows the urgency of the problem. And <coughs> to make it a bit worse for you, uh, here we have, this is following also from the Paris Agreement, this black line over here is a reasonable scenario that you can follow in terms of CO2 emissions if you want to stay below two degrees. And then you can say, well, what did the countries promise in Paris? So what were the pledges they made in their policies for the future? Then we have the USA. They say, well, we will follow this line in terms of CO2. So we will slowly go down in our emissions. European Union, okay, we will also slowly go down in terms of emissions. India, well, we said, we're not going down yet. First, we want to grow. That's our right, because we're still poor and we want to develop ourselves. China, same story. So first we want to develop ourselves and then we will maybe go down with emissions. If you look, they take these four together, then already use up, you've used up all the CO2 available to remain below two degrees. Then the rest of the world still has to come. So Africa, South America, they're not in the game yet. So <coughs> the message here is that 
The Paris Agreement is a very, very ambitious target, two degrees, one and a half is even more ambitious. And based on the promises the countries made in Paris, we're not going to make it. That really means that if you follow the, the Paris Agreement and you follow the, the, the climate policies following, coming from the Paris Agreement, we're closer to a world of three degrees than a world of two degrees warming. So that's maybe not the, 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 the nicest message, message I can give, but that's coming from uh, the policies making so far. And since Paris, well, USA dropped out, so leave them come worse. And that means, so if you look, look at the climate problem, what do you have to do? Well, we have to understand the climate system, we have to think of mitigation, we really have to adapt ourselves to climate change. But then, if all this doesn't work out, and the risk that it doesn't work out, is pretty big at the moment. Should we then start to think about climate engineering or geoengineering? So should we think of techniques that will cool the earth if we need it? So if it gets too warm on earth, maybe we need a technique that we can put out of the, uh, pull out of the drawer to cool the earth in case it gets too hot. <coughs> now, to, think, to develop such techniques, you have to understand what you see over here. This is a scheme, a schematic overview of the energy flows in the atmosphere and system Earth. And as you all know, most of the, the, the energy is coming from the sun. That's the yellow line over here. Part of the sunlight is reflected by the atmosphere. Clouds are the biggest uh, source of reflection. Part of the energy from the sun hits the surface of the Earth and it heats up the surface. The Earth gets warmer. In response, the Earth starts to radiate heat itself. Because if you get warm up, you start to radiate more heat. And the atmosphere, and that's the, the, the good thing of the greenhouse effect, the atmosphere starts to absorb a bit of the radiation coming from the Earth. And if the atmosphere starts to absorb energy, it also will release energy, because it's always looking for a balance between incoming and outgoing energy. And part of this absorbed energy from the, from the, the surface of the Earth is radiated back again to the Earth and heats up the Earth again. So there's a mechanism here, oh, on, on this side over here, where the, uh, the Earth itself gets warmer because of absorption of radiation in the atmosphere. The main source here is the greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, that's the main source of absorption, but also clouds play an important role and other greenhouse gases. And interestingly, if you look at the numbers, while the sun is the main source of energy, the main energy itself is coming from the atmosphere, not from the sun. So this number here is much bigger than the number coming from the sun itself. So the greenhouse effect around the Earth, the atmosphere, plays a very large role in, uh, in the energy system of the Earth itself and how we keep us Earth warm. If you would remove the atmosphere, the temperature would drop by something like 33 degrees or so. It would be minus 18 degrees all over the globe. So it's a very important aspect. So now think of climate engineering. So suppose the Earth gets too warm. Now you can see what you can do. You can try to manipulate this, manip this arrow, so get less solar energy into the system. It will cool. Or reduce this arrow over here. So remove CO2 from the atmosphere. These are the two main techniques that you can uh, play with. Uh, well, I don't have so much time on it. So let's first think about the, 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 the CO2 removal. And I, want, I want to talk more about the, the, the solar radiation management later on. If you look at the emissions of CO2 in the system right now, then we can talk about the sources, and 91% of the sources of CO2 in the atmosphere, of the additional source of CO2 in the atmosphere, is coming from fossil energy sources. And practically 9, 9 to 10 percent is coming from land use changes. So that means that while we get upset about things happening in the Amazon, so, and everybody's angry, but we don't touch the Amazon anymore, the biggest source is still, f still fossil. In all cases, when we talk about reducing the warming, we have to think about the fossil. It's really by far the biggest contributor to the global warming. So also when we talk about climate engineering, we want to reduce the global warming, 
and you want to extract CO2 from the atmosphere, this is the reason. You have to think about how we can reduce this number. Well, where does the, all the CO2 end up? Well, part of the 30% ends up in vegetation, so the forests are doing a good job over there. About 25% ends up in the ocean, but 44% of this remains in the atmosphere. And it stays there for a long time. I mean, the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere is something like, uh, on the shortest time scale, something like 100, 150 years. But longer time scales, if you take geological process into account, easily thousands of years. So every molecule you put into the atmosphere has the chance of staying there for a very long time. So <coughs> this is the background of how we can think in terms of, of climate engineering. And like I said, there were two techniques. One is carbon dioxide removal. So remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And the current term for this is, is negative emissions. And uh, this is already part of the climate uh, agreement of Paris. I will not show this, but it's in the agreement already that after 2050, we should have techniques to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. If we don't have these techniques, then we will still fail. So we still need techniques to remove CO2. Well, another technique is solar radiation management. So how can we block sunlight and then cool the Earth? If you put it in a scheme, now there are many different uh, ideas have been proposed for this. So for instance, uh, we can play with aerosols in the stratosphere. So you can put tiny dust particles, order of a micron, and you can bring them into the stratosphere 20, 25 kilometers high, and they will act as small reflectors of sunlight. And they will cool the Earth. And it works. You can do this. You can also put giant uh, mirrors, reflectors in space. So just block sunlight. And do you have any idea of how much sunlight we should block for this? Two? Ten percent? Sixty? It's almost nothing. If you look at the incoming radiation, 340 watts per square, there's a test. Did you, did you see the graph before? Two graphs, did you, do you remember the numbers? 340 watts per square meters coming in, and 339 is going out, so there's an unbalance of one watt. So if you can change one watt on the 340, it's almost nothing. So you don't have to do that much here. So it, it's also doable, you can do this. So reflect uh, sunlight from space. You can play with clouds. Now I'll talk more about how you can manipulate clouds uh, here. What you also can do, you can say, well, let's apply some uh, iron fertilization of the oceans. So what you can do, if you fertilize the oceans, more plankton will grow, and plankton will feed on the CO2 in the atmosphere. And some, some day, plankton will die, and then it will sink to the bottom of the ocean and stay there for thousands of years. And CO2 is removed. So you can play with this. Vegetation, this everybody likes, uh, planting trees, uh, but this is the most uh, popular idea, but not the best idea. You can play with genetic manipulation, you can talk about, well, can we make the dead deserts green, so also that change the reflection of solar light by the deserts. You can also try to make the, the deserts white, so you can store CO2 in the subsurface, so carbon capture storage, all these techniques uh, are available. I'll skip this, this is too detailed, and I'll focus more on this, on solar radiation management. Because um, solar radiation management is by far the most uh, effective technique for this. And a couple of reasons. Many of these techniques that you think of in terms of solar radiation management uh, can be deployed fast and they can be switched on and off fast. So they're quite safe in that sense. So you can play with it more easily. It all comes down to reducing the amount of sunlight reaching the surface of the Earth. And if you look at this scheme, well, you can play with the clouds. If you can make the clouds more reflective, brighter, then more sunlight will be reflected into the space. And this will cool the planet. You can also play with uh, dust particles in higher up, and they reflect sunlight. You can also say, well, let's make the surface whiter and reflect more sunlight. Now, these are all straightforward ideas. Practice more difficult, but straightforward ideas. We can do this. 
And nature has also shown us how this should be done. Because we know from experience, the moment you have volcano eruptions, the large ones in the tropics, then we also know that for a long time, a year, sometimes two years, we have a cooler Earth. And simply because all these, this, this smoke in, in the, into the atmosphere, if it reaches high levels, it will stay there for a long time. And that's what you can, that's what you can see over here. This is time uh, from 88 till 93. And this is a, a measurement done with a laser beam. So it points a laser beam into the atmosphere. And the moment you have dust particles in the laser beam, you get a tiny reflection. So it's a bit like a, a radar that you have. And then you can measure the distance of the, the dust particles, also the concentration. And you can make profiles of dust clouds. And what you see here in 92, we had the uh, eruption of the Pinatubo. And then for these two years over here was a huge ash cloud between 15 and 25 kilometers over there. At the same time, that's what you can see over here, uh, the temperature in the Earth uh, dropped by practically one degree, global mean temperature. So nature is showing us what we can do if you want to cool the Earth here. It's also showing us that if you have a volcanic eruption, the effect itself is temporary. So it's manageable. So that's one thing, and I'll come back to this later. Another thing is you can play with clouds. And uh, I'm sure you all like clouds, right? <coughs> Now, well, you should like clouds, because what, happens if it, what would happen if you take the clouds away? It will be, uh, you get 10 degrees more warming. So the clouds are lifesavers. On average, the clouds, they cool the Earth by 10 degrees. Without clouds, the, the Earth would be 10 degrees warmer. It's also one of the big challenges in climate, in climate change studies, that uh, this cooling effect of clouds might become less in a warmer, in a warmer world, world, a warmer climate. So the CO2 warming leads to feedback mechanisms in the climate system, where the cloud deck itself might become a bit uh, thinner or a bit smaller. So more <laughs> sunlight reaches the Earth and leads to more warming. So clouds are very important here. So even if you don't like them, you still have to like them because you need them. But if you look at clouds, uh, most people think that if you that take water vapor and you cool it down or you, you, you bring it upwards, at some point, by magic, it condense, condenses into liquid. That doesn't happen. If you want to form a cloud droplet in the atmosphere, you need aerosols. So if you have clean air of moist air, water vapor over here, but nothing in it, just water vapor, and you bring it up to colder levels, nothing will happen because you need or a much, uh, uh, much more hi uh, higher uh, water vapor pressure or much cool, uh, lower temperature before you get clouds. What you need is dust in the atmosphere, because every cloud droplet grows around a dust particle in the atmosphere. And that's important, because this tells us that the air pollution levels in the atmosphere influence the cloud composition. So for instance, if you deal with just a few aerosols, so clean air, and around these few aerosols cloud droplets are growing, then they can take all the water vapor around it. And what you get then is a cloud with just a few droplets, but they can grow large. If you have many aerosols, so many dust particles, and they this is uh, and this, this, this uh, transported upwards, then they will also collect water vapor, but then the water vapor is distributed over many more particles, so they remain small. And the impact of this is important, because the total area of such a cloud is smaller than the total area of this cloud. That means that this cloud over here, which is a few aerosols, will reflect less sunlight than this cloud over there. So by manipulating the aerosols that feed into the clouds, you can also manipulate how solar radiation is reflected by these clouds. At the same time, <coughs> in such a cloud with just a few large droplets, rain droplets will, will, will form easily. And you get rain 
in this situation over here where you have many small droplets, it takes much longer for clouds to form. So on the one hand, it has an impact on reflection of solar light. On the other hand, it has an impact on how rain is formed, so on the water cycle. So you can see the problem. If you want to manipulate clouds by reflecting more sunlight, so we want to go from here to here, we're also playing with the water cycle, so rainfall. So that's for the next ethical discussion. Uh, is this allowed, yes or no? Well, we, we can see examples of this from space. This is a satellite image over here with uh, a cloud deck. And from space you can determine how big cloud droplets are in the cloud deck. And the purple here means it's large droplets, and here the, gr the yellow, greenish, plume are small droplets. And then you can say, okay, what's the origin of those plumes? And then you can see, well, it's linked to the heavy industry. So the moment you have heavy industry somewhere and they inject or emit dust particles into the atmosphere, they start to manipulate the clouds. Already you can see this effect. So, same here. If you look at, uh, again, satellite image over here, but also here, of clouds over the ocean, you see these white bands in there. And these white bands are not natural clouds. They are formed by ships sailing below these clouds. And the emission from the exhaust of, of the ship itself contains the tiny dust particles. They act as condensation nuclei and they increase the brightness of these clouds. So they increase how clouds reflect sunlight. And this is what we can see already. And for climate engineering, you want to use this principle to do this on a larger scale. <coughs> so here we have another example. So this is what we do in the lab. So before you try to want to deploy such techniques, well, you do simulations. Uh, and we have developed simulations for, for cloud fields, how cloud fields are formed. And then we can say, well, here we have a cloud field, the same cloud field, but with clean air, so just a tiny, small amount of dust particles, and polluted air with a large number of dust particles. And then we let this cloud field evolve over time and see what happens with the cloud formation itself. And what you see, two hours, six hours, 10 hours, 13 hours. In this case, the cloud field, so clean air, the cloud field disappears because it starts to rain. And when it rains, the cloud falls on the ground and the cloud is gone. In this case, the cloud becomes thicker and stays for, persists for a much longer time. Oh. So you can really see by manipulating clouds, by feeding it with dust from below, you can play with the lifetime of these clouds, so that they will stay longer, and you can play with, you can manipulate how much rain will fall out of from the cloud. And how can you do this? Well, this is a popular uh, image. Uh, you want to do this over the oceans, because that's where most of the cloud decks are. So you need ship uh, to feed aerosols into the clouds. And this is an artist's impression of why well, you can think of sailing ships like this with chimneys and they take sea salt from uh, the surface of the, the ocean itself and they bring it upwards and pump it into the cloud field itself. And of course you need hundreds of these ships to do it because you, the, the cloud decks are huge but can be done in principle. But then <coughs> does it work? Well for this you have to think about uh, yeah, what's the best location for this, uh, what's the best timing for this, and then uh, uh, how can we study uh, whether it would work and what would the consequences be. Well, <coughs> here we have uh, uh, a simulation or a model calculation with climate models of the impact that uh, marine cloud brightening can have. On the globe there are three important cloud fields. And there's one huge cloud field off the coast of California, thousands of kilometers. There's one cloud field off the coast of Chile, also thousands of kilometers, and one off the coast of Namibia on the Atlantic. And these are huge cloud fields, a few hundred meters high, and thousands of kilometers, and they, uh, the original air from the sea itself is quite clean. So it means if you add aerosol from below, the impact is quite big because you start from clean air and you make it polluted. You pollute the air. 
So what you can see over here, this area, this area, and this area, well, that's polluted from below, sea salt, and indeed the impact, blue means lots of cooling, is quite big. We also see that it's only a local effect and start to spread out to a global effect in a much more uh, diffuse way. But some areas get more cooling than the other. And this means that you start to play with the global climate. It's not only <coughs> a cooling of the same amount everywhere, so the whole world comes up or goes down with one degree. Now some parts will go down with two degrees and one, some parts will go with half a degree. And that's an important aspect that you really should understand because you start to manipulate the local weather and the living conditions of people. <coughs> if it were that easy that you could just say, well, I take one number, reduce the mean of all people in the same way, then it would not be such a problem. But in this case it is. Then, like I said, well, if you start to play with these clouds, you start to manipulate uh, the rainfall formation, Rainfall is food production. I'm running out of time? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. <laughs> well, rainfall is drinking water, food production, so to manipulate this. So also this is something you have to understand. And what you see <coughs> with the same models, that on average, the, the, the total amount of rainfall doesn't change that much. So it's simple because, yeah, a simple word, what goes up will come down. But what happens is the spatial distribution is completely different. So some parts in Africa might get more rain, and some parts in South America, the rainforest for instance, will get less rain if you do this. So you start to manipulate the water cycle. And this is not necessarily bad or good or bad, it's something you have to understand. And it's something then you need a discussion, okay, what's acceptable <laughs> or not acceptable. But that's something we can do. <coughs> Then you can take all different techniques, but I have no time to go through all of them. But you can use uh, all the techniques like well, uh, changing the clouds, but also making the deserts whiter or play with grasslands or urban areas and calculate all the effects they might have. Well, forget about this table, just look at this number over here. And the larger this number and the more negative it is, the better it works. And what you see that mechanical cloud changes, that's the technique I just described, works best. It's by something like minus 3.7 watts per square meter. And we just saw when I started talking that we only need one watt per square meter if we would do this today. So it really works and we can really change, cool down the earth with this technique. The other ones, so playing, making desert white or uh, changing uh, cities, also work. So if you would make the large deserts on the globe, so Sahara, uh, the Gobi Desert, so all these huge deserts, if you would make them more reflective, it would work. They could cool the earth. So local spots, they're the same size as the cloud fields. If you would make, put mirrors there, it will work. <laughs> it will cool the earth. If you look at urban areas, because this is also a popular thing people always come up with, yeah, we should make all the rooftops white, doesn't work. And a simple reason for this, there are not enough rooftops. Cities are quite small. If you take all the cities together, global, and put them in one, one area, it's just a tiny percentage of the earth. So you need more cities if you want to make this more productive. You can do something similar, similar calculations for the, uh, the, the carbon dioxide removal. So a forestation, so planting trees everywhere, you know, all these techniques. Look at these numbers over here, they're not so efficient. So that means that if you want to apply these techniques, uh, you have to do combine different techniques together to get uh, large acceptable numbers. One technique technique that can work is air capture and storage. So remove CO2 with filters or, or huge machines and store it in the ground. Except these machines do not exist, exist yet at least not on the scale that we need them. Lots of work is done on capturing CO2 at the source, at chimneys, but not by removing it from the atmosphere. Because do you have any idea how much CO2 we have in the atmosphere in terms of percentages? It's 0.04 percent. 
That's hardly anything. So if you want to remove this from the atmosphere, think of the energy you need to remove to filter this out of the atmosphere. So it's still a huge challenge. So if you had to choose between these two techniques in terms of effectiveness, then solar radiation management is the best technique to go for. It's also the one with the, uh, yeah, the biggest uncertainties, uh, the potential biggest impact, uh, political uh, uh, issues, uh, ethical issues. But if you want to cool the earth, and you can deal with the politics, and you can deal with the ethics, then this is the way to go. Uh, in general, if you say, well, if you look at these techniques, what should they, what would be the criteria? Well, of course, they should work. It should be safe. Uh, you have to talk about the cost, but I think Frank might be talking more about these issues over here. One important aspect is always what I stress with the students in Delft also is you should be able to switch it off. And that's a very important part. You should be able to switch it off. So, <coughs> in overview, uh, here we have a nice graph of how affordable the te techniques are and uh, how effective they are. And if you're up here, then you're good. And if you're up here, well, it doesn't do that much. So don't bother. And what you see that techniques of putting uh, aerosols into the stratosphere or uh, think of uh, cloud albedo uh, uh, techniques or, or forestation techniques, that's the region you should look into for if you want to be successful in climate engineering. And I don't want to talk about this because this is for the next two speakers. And uh, sometimes when I, uh, well not sometimes, it happens quite regularly, uh, people say, well, what you talk about, climate engineering, that's dangerous, that's uh, foolish, you shouldn't even think about it. And then I always say, well, I don't want to apply climate engineering. I don't think we should, uh, I hope we would never need it. But if you look at the way the world is going today, with all the policies that we are trying to develop and, and uh, we are heading for a world of three degrees. And if you need a technique to cool the earth at some point and you don't have the technique available, then you're too late. So we have to prepare ourselves for a world which is getting too warm, maybe 20, <coughs> maybe 30 years from now. But the techniques we're talking about today still need 20 years of development time before they will be operational. That's on the technological side, that's on the political side, that's on the governance side. We still need 20 years. So we have to think about these techniques from today onwards. Because we need them. At the same time, this should never and never be an excuse to stop the reduction of CO2 emissions. That should go to zero as soon as we can. Because that's the real source of the problem. And with this, I think I've used up my time. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Herman. You can, can leave the, the, the okay, mic on. Okay. We have time for some uh, questions. I will have a mic over here. Thank you very much. Um, I, I certainly realized that my honey wheel metaphor was far too simplistic um, because you explained all kind of complex mechanisms yeah. and, and feedback loops and things like that. So it's much more complicated in real life. But you did a great job in explaining all those mechanisms. Um, are there any questions for, uh, for Herman? There is, uh, I come up, then we have it recorded as well. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, you're a decade off in uh, CO2 concentration, but that doesn't really matter much. Um, I'm currently writing the carbon uh, footprint report for the university, and um, a discussion I often encounter is the influence of uh, plane travel. Um, Normal plane com uh, air air pl airline companies they use the CO2 from the from the, the gasoline they use. However, most NGOs they calculate a certain additional impact also of aerosols, um, mostly because of the, the height that the water is uh, rejected from the airplanes. Can you give any insights on that? Because I'm yeah. very curious. Yeah, well, and, uh, thanks. Yeah, flying. Well, that is a very popular uh, topic in the climate debate. As the, as the for several impacts. One is the CO2 impact, direct and direct CO2. There's the water vapor component coming from the airplanes. And at the high levels, the water vapor, together with the aerosol 
already present where the air is also coming from the engine of the airplane will lead to cloud formation, cirrus formation. And you can see this. So the, the mm -hmm. contrails from an airplane at 10 kilometers or that, that altitude uh, can slowly transform into a thin ice cloud, cirrus clouds. And these thin cirrus clouds lead to more warming. So it's not just the CO2 itself as, as a greenhouse gas, but also the cloud at this altitude leads to more warming. So it amplifies the effect. Uh, the total contribution of flying today into the total warming is still quite small. It's around 6% or so. So it's significant, but it's not the biggest chunk. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that enough or do you want to have more? Mm -hmm. But Herman, I, I recently read an article, I believe it was from somebody from Delft, who claims mm -hmm. that the contrails also reflect light again, so they will yeah. can have a cooling effect. Yeah, is that that's, that's, that's not the main effect. That's okay, that's just a sm very small, yeah. aha, okay. No, no, that just shows how complicated uh, things are. Here we have another question. Go ahead. There you are. Um, it's interesting to, to read these three points. It raises the question with me, who's responsible? If you think about mitigation, it's all of us. We have a responsibility and we have to do something. If you say, okay, there's a, <coughs> a big visionary solution, geoengineering, we don't feel any more responsible. And then the second point, who's in charge of the earth? Can you guarantee that this, <laughs> this large-scale engineering with the earth will have benefits for everybody on the earth without that people losing out? Um, I think that's real, uh, really an issue we have to, a social mm. science issue we have to take. Mm -hmm. you c in, in many parts of engineering, you have people who benefit and others who lose. Yep. And the mm. question, that's not a technical question, it's a social issue. Uh, who loses out when we start to work with these kind of techniques? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, I Thank agree you. complete. I think that the next speakers will say more about yes, it. Yep. But I can give you my, 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 my position mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, difficult, the most difficult part of this whole issue. I mean, the technological mm. part can be developed. Uh, we can do this. And we can, at least, we think we can do this. So we, we are arrogant enough. But the development of international uh, organizations or international procedures and, and right agreements about responsibilities or funding, who's going to pay and who's going to uh, pay for the ones who are uh, losing, mm -hmm. uh, that's the most difficult part. Because if you look at international agreements, I mean, they want to do one agreement uh, between Canada and, and uh, Europe, and it takes already nine years or so, and that's the easy one. So now talk about this. <laughs> this will take 20, 25 mm -hmm. years at least <laughs> to come up with these issues. Yeah. I think this question is a very nice bridge to our next uh, speaker. Mm -hmm. But before we, uh, we have Frank here, I want a big hand for Herman again. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Frank, Good. the floor is yours. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. So my talk is now, so I'm a political scientist with a background also international law, and I will pick up especially this last question on the social science aspects, the political aspect of all these ideas that are presented by Hermann and that are in the literature. But starting, I think, for many of you who have never heard about geoengineering before, you might think this is totally crazy, I think. I mean, who has ever thought about geoengineering, the climate and all these technologies? So Herman has done research about this for a long time. I've read a little bit the social science literature. But for most people, this is totally crazy and totally new. But my argument is, as a social scientist, we are too late in the process to ignore difficult discussions. So I don't say I'm in favor or against, but I think we definitely have at the current situation, at the current state of climate policy, to start discussing these issues and form our own opinion. This is like a caucus, like it may, so that we all have to have our opinions as citizens, as scientists, where are we standing in the debate on the future of the climate system. So therefore, I'm very happy about this event that the University of Twente has put this year together, because it's a really important issue that we start talking about it. And I summarize Hermann's first slides in one slide, and this brings us to this discussion. The one photo is from 1992, that was this famous Rio conference where climate change was for the first time big on the agenda. Some of you might remember this, there was this big discussion, the decision, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we all work together, climate change is a common concern of humankind, we cut down the emissions, this was a big claim of Rio, and 
The other four, uh, slide shows you nothing much has happened. Since then, emissions have not been reduced by governments and by local actors and by citizens. Instead, we have increased our emissions all over the world, and some countries more, some sectors more. So this is kind of a messy situation. And for that reason, some experts have said quite some time ago, so this is a quote of Bob Watson, a famous British scientist who has run the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at some point, and he said already some years ago, we should politically still target the two degrees. That's, we should aim for the two degree target, but as scientists, as experts, as researchers, we should really think also how can we prepare for four degrees warming? How can we prepare for a situation that politics are not working out, that consumers are not changing, that new technologies are not being invented? How can we prepare for four degrees? And that was his claim in 2008, and I started that time to work on adaptation governance a little bit, because it's a very, very big question. And my argument would be, we cannot really prepare. We cannot really imagine a world that is four degrees warmer. I mean, this is one map from one of my colleagues, it's Netherlands in 2300, and there's not much left of the country. I mean, you guys are still here, luckily, you know, so, but all the others are kind of gone in 2300. So therefore, this is not really a scenario we want to live in. We can't really imagine a world that is four degree warmer. And this brings us to this new century, the 21st century challenge, as I would call it. The challenge between the good Anthropocene, which is mitigation. That is the vision that we all change our lifestyles, our technologies globally and reduce emissions in a way that we achieve the 1.5 or the 2 degree targets. And we know we have kind of 10 years <laughs> to go in a way to really achieve this. And the other options are what I would describe as a terrible Anthropocene. And this is either drastic adaptation measures, all kind of stuff that we don't have to discuss here, or then the plan B or the plan C that increasingly is being discussed. There are the first field experiments in America being done on solar radiation management and these kind of issues. So this is kind of what some people increasingly in the academic community say, this could be a way out, at least for some time, not necessarily forever, but for a temporary solution in the 21st century till we have changed our behavior in the 22nd, uh, <laughs> over the next 100 years. So these are kind of the debates that we have, and they're very difficult. And my question is, as a political scientist, can we govern geoengineering? Can we really find political solutions to these ideas that Hermann has laid out? And this is the core of my presentation, and some of the issues I want to run through in a couple of minutes and not spending too much time. Important it is, of course, to distinguish between the main technologies. So Hermann has presented 10 or 15 different ones, but they come down to these two main ones that I present here. The one is blocking the sun, dimming the sun, as it's sometimes being called, having some technologies like uh, sulfur emissions in the atmosphere that can block parts of the sunlight. And here the political question is very much who is doing it. And it's very much a question of control and decision making. Who is deciding about it? Who is caring about the losses also if we have different impacts in different countries, different temperatures in different countries? So here it's very much a question about democratic decision making at the global level. Seven billion people kind of should get together democratically. And it is a question of control. Controlling those actors that are doing these kind of technologies. So this is a one question. The other one is what's sometimes called, I mean, Hammond didn't use that term, but it's negative emissions technology. It's all the stuff, all these technologies that take out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. You can have machines, Hammond mentioned this, and the most widely discussed one is just plants, trees all kind of plants, you grow them, it takes unfortunately a long time for them to grow, so it's a really long-term solution, and then you take out the carbon in some way out of the burned trees or the burned trucks or the burned plants, whatever it is. And then if you do the genetic modi modification mechanism, it can even be quicker. So here the question is not necessarily global control necessarily, because if the Netherlands is kind of deciding on a huge campaign on planting trees, it's not bad for anybody, it's just good for the world in a way. But here the question is, for example, food competition. Because if you really want to have massive programs 
on negative emission technology, massive programs of planting trees and other plants to remove the carbon out of the atmosphere. At some point, you can start a margin land, but at some point you will compete with land that we are using today for food. And 800 million people don't have enough food today. And we will have 2 billion people more very soon. So there's an inherent competition with land use for a variety of other purposes. So here the question is very much also about control. How do we manage food production and food provision for 9 billion people at some point, while at the same time using all this land or lots of these lands to, uh, to get the carbon out of the atmosphere? It's another governance challenge, but it's an equally important and difficult one. So, if you look at this from a governance perspective, I'm like, political scientists are sometimes divided, like, there's global governance and there's local actions, and they have public activities, and you have private governance or governance by sub-national actors. I think most people agree that a lot of these technologies that Herman has presented, we would like to have in the top level, in a sense. You would probably not like to leave this to the private sector. And you would probably not like to regulate it at the local level. So this is a typical governance problem that you would like to locate with governments who have the authority to deal with these issues and are also democratically legitimate in many cases. And at the same time, it requires obviously a global solution and global agreement. You can't just do it alone as one country. So what we need is strong global institutions to deal with these issues in a democratic way. Do we have these institutions? No, that's one question to answer. But starting, before I start about the effect of that institution, I want to bring in one concern that Herman has already hinted at, and it was also mentioned a bit in the intervention here, is the question of global inequality. Because the world is, in the current situation, one of the most unequal places humankind has ever created. And we have to take this into account. So if you look at the core data, it's 76% of all wealth of the earth is spent by just 20%. And the poorest 20% of people on earth, they have a consumption of 1.5% of the global private consumption. It's a tremendously unequal situation that we have. And this is an unequal quality in terms of consumption. It's an unequality in terms of emissions, causation of the climate problem. It's also an inequality in terms of power to regulate, to deal with these kind of issues. And if you drive it even one step further, there are eight people on this planet that have as much wealth as half of humanity. These are kind of the richest people in the world, and they have as much wealth on their bank accounts and in their investments that uh, equal to what half of humanity has. And this is the situation in which we are, and this makes these debates and these technologies also extremely dangerous, extremely complicated, extremely uh, debatable also from an ethical perspective, and I think we come back to that. So my question is also very much, what does geoengineering mean for the global poor? And here I have done some research, what we have done is analyzing, and from a social science perspective, to what extent this is actually a solution of the rich. We call this paper rich man solution, in which we analyzed global debates and global discourses on geoengineering. So in a sense, one thing, we counted participants at these workshops. Who is actually talking about geoengineering? If you do these kind of analyses of conferences, of workshops, of papers, if you look at the discourses that come out of these meetings, it's essentially only three countries that are talking about these issues, which is the United States, United Kingdom, and Germany, and the Netherlands number four. And most developing countries are not taking part in this debate at all. And one reason is also they're not informed partially, also they lack the research capacity to run all these models, to do all these studies. So this is a situation that is not necessarily leading to equitable global governance if there's only three countries that are debating these issues and that have the capacities to deal with these issues. So therefore, my first proposition is that if we really... That's not mine, no? No. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, that any deployment of climate engineering technologies, I would argue they require the full prior informed consent of the Global South in whatever shape you want to have this, in particular by the least developed countries, because these are also the most vulnerable countries if something goes wrong. And I would argue this one step further, probably much more controversial, that even research, 
on geoengineering requires the prior informed consent of developing countries and some form of shape, because just developing these technologies creates also realities. It creates also a dominance of those who own the technologies, who can work on these technologies, and even this, I would argue, requires global control and global consent of the global south. And then a discourse on these kind of technologies requires, I would argue, also a strong programs on raising the independent scientific capacities in the global south. There are lots of activities right now to involve people in developing countries in these, uh, these debates, but this is quite often a unilateral thing. This means that flying people to the south, organizing workshops, presenting the findings, presenting the options, but this is not a bilateral research program. It's just a kind of a presenting the options and then trying to include stakeholders. It's not the independent assessment of options by actors in the South for the interests of developing countries. I think this is very much important if we're really seriously thinking about having geoengineering programs at global scale. Coming now to effective control and the question from the audience that we had before. How do we govern this? You would have probably to have some kind of meeting, some kind of assembly meeting, but then who are the actors who can really control these issues? I mean, the first the top photo is uh, a famous photo from the Copenhagen summit on climate which failed from the delegate from Haiti and shows kind of this despair when the summit failed. And Haiti is, of course, one country that cannot control these issues. If other countries go for it, there's nothing that Haiti and many other least developed countries can do to in any way influence outcomes. The second photo of the American president is much more likely. America can do it. And some people say that Donald Trump, if he would really believe in climate change at some point, he might want to go for it because it fits to this mind frame. It's a top technology owned by Americans. You can do it alone. It's very media generic in a sense where people can really see you pressing the button. And then, so in a sense, I mean, of course, the debates will be for 2004 to 2050, but it is a technology that could be used for these kind of people. There are some debates about private investors, some of these billionaires that I showed before, because technically they could do it themselves. You don't need a government. If you have a couple of billions to spare, you can invest in these technologies, and you could really say, I take all my hedge fund money and put it into geoengineering. Technically possible, partially even not, at present it's not even un illegal to do these kind of things. So how do we <laughs> regulate this if a hedge fund manager, a billionaire, is investing all the money into these technologies? And then, of course, people talk about America, etc. But there are also other important, powerful countries. China, for example, has one of the largest weather modification programs in the world. We did a paper uh, with some colleagues of mine who were, were informed about Chinese policies about the Chinese approaches to weather modification, and they have no discussion on geoengineering right now, but they have, of the many of you, they're just moving clouds up in there and rain with radar. They got the Olympic Games with sunshines because they have these infrastructures, they have the apparatus there, not for geoengineering at that level, but the legal framework they actually do have, and they have also positive experiences, it's very much ingrained. So why not believe that maybe at some point China could go and say, we do geoengineering. And what is then the position of all the others? What is then the position of the Netherlands, for example? I come back to this. So these are all very complicated questions of control. And they require, if we ever would go into this direction, strong global institutions. And this is what we do not have. So we need, in a sense, a different type of United Nations. We have a United Nations now, but this was set up 70 years ago. I show some of these old black and white shots. And the point is, since then, structurally, not much has changed. I mean, who knows how often the world environment is mentioned in the chart of United Nations, our constitutional document at the global level. How often is the world environment mentioned? Yeah. What is it? Never. Never, yeah. Of course, because 1945 nobody talked about it. I don't ask you about climate and Anthropocene and sustainability, all these issues. The entire structure was set up in the 40s and in the 1950s. So this is kind of an outdated structure, how we run our planet, and we are not fit institution-wise to really deal with issues of saying, let's dim the sun. So we would need to have a step change from the current organizations to a United Nations 2.0.
And I have no idea how this would look like. It would definitely take a major investment from all countries and actors and civil society to get to these kind of stronger institutions that would be able to deal with these issues. I mean, this is one of my own research lines. So I spend a lot of my time, in a way, to think about how we could strengthen global institutions and to get to what we call in our group the Earth System Governance, really trying to develop stronger governance mechanisms that can deal with these challenges. But it's clearly not the case that we have solutions and that they are pretty likely at present to deal with these kind of issues. One, for example, is just the mode of decision making. The Climate Convention, for example, operates based on the consensus principle. That means any decision requires the agreement of every country in the room. That means if we would decide now what to have for dinner or for dessert, you had already your dinner, I mean, or for drinks, that means we all would have to decide together. If one person says no, then the entire agreement doesn't work. This is stupid, but this is how we run the Climate Convention, as an example, and many other activities. So therefore, the argument is, let's work towards majority voting, which is also in some international agreements. But the point is, how do we do majority voting? The current UN's approach is one country, one vote, which means we have China and India, and Indonesia and Brazil sitting there in one line, and then you have Monaco, Andorra, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, San Marino, Vatican, whatever, they're all sitting in the other line, and they all have one vote. This is not working in a way, so the Chinese will not accept geoengineering in which they can be outvoted by Liechtenstein. So we need to have a different approach. And then some people say, well, then let's do it one person, one vote. This is the democratic, that's how we run the Netherlands. One person, one vote. Everybody has one vote and then we get the government. But of course, how do we do this globally? If we would say one person, one vote, seven countries today, seven countries alone would have the majority, the big ones. I mean, China, India, United States, and so not to mention where the Netherlands would be in this picture. In a sense. So this is also something that many countries would say, well, it's maybe also different. So we need to have different ways of global decision making and we don't know them. So therefore, proposition number two is any deployment, I would argue also substantial research on this, requires a fundamental strengthening of global institutions and also we need to have some ways of majority decision making that are agreeable either for all issues or especially for these kind of issues of geoengineering. This is kind of my second proposition. It becomes even more complicated now. More complicated because we have to talk about time. That was a little bit implicit in Hermann's presentation. These things have to function for centuries. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I mean, some of them you can do for a short time, but the idea is, of course, like carbon sequestration, you take the carbon out, you put it underground forever. That's the idea, because if it comes out, for your grand, great, great grandchildren, then they will have a climate, galloping climate effect. Solar radiation management is more short term, but if you stop it, you have what people call the termination shock. So then you have immediately, unless you take action, of course, at the same time on mitigation, immediately you have a tremendous uh, shock in a way that climate change is getting much stronger. So we're talking about institutions that have to be effective for many, many, many years. And our current experience is four years, <laughs> and that's what we do. I mean, for four years we vote for government. We never voted for an institution for 100 years. So we don't really know how to do this. And that one paper, which is really kind of one of my, my strange hobbies in a way, <laughs> about what we call long-term organizations. We looked at organizations that have been around for hundreds of years. It was a little bit an experiment in a sense. So we found my favorite one is the one, there's a pointer here, this kind of, uh, yeah, the, the, this one favorite. It's a Japanese private company, it's a family business that has been active for 1,500 years as a family business. Can you imagine? I mean, that's kind of, I mean, so, I mean, even the Queen of England is kind of, <laughs> so, so in a sense, I mean, so, we looked at them, we looked at them, we compared them. So we have, of course, all the oldest dynasty is a Japanese one. You have the Catholic Church, 2,000 years with leadership transition in a, in a way. The oldest sports association, the oldest insurance. We looked at these organizations that have been around for many years. Well, to what makes them actually so special that they have been around and turned all the paper which we published. But the key issue in this one is because most of these organizations are actually extremely undemocratic and very elitist. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the Japanese monarchy or the Catholic Church or a family-run business? I mean, this is not a deliberative mechanism. It's always some person, quite often a man, who takes decisions and then it goes through the generations 
it's not really how I want to have global governance in, in a sense, these organizations. So we, need to, we would need to find new ways of governing over long periods of time that are somewhat democratic and not like the monarchies and the family businesses. So proposition number three is any of these deployments of these things requires new types of global decision making. Very difficult, I mentioned this already, but then they should also be active and effective over long periods of time uh, in the terms of like deep time organizations and they should also be somewhat democratic. I mean, that's kind of what we want to have. We want to have democratic governance, isn't it? I mean, that's what we want to have. So, how do we do this? And the problem is democracy is actually because decisions have to be taken. And because this, if you look at this one here, this is a two degree. What do we want to have actually? Two degree was the agreement of Paris. Was it the right one? I don't know. Maybe 1.9 maybe 2.1, so we could also discuss it in a way. So that means at some point, if we engage in these technologies, especially solar radiation management, we would have agreed on targets. We would say, well, let's do it half a degree, or let's do it one degree, or let's do it two degree. And the point is, we are seven billion. So we have to have an agreement on the temperature of our planet with seven billion people. It's not easy. I believe. I mean, so, but these are the decisions we have essentially have. So we need to have a way of democratic decision making with 7 billion people about the eventual target values that we want to have. And then it comes also the more complicated even that the, the, the regional variation will be, so you can overcool and undercool and all kind of stuff can happen. It's also not fully understood, despite, I mean, great research being done, but I mean, even Hammond wouldn't say you fully understand the system. <laughs> That's kind of so, so in a sense, we, we might have that at some point, some people are kind of putting some aerosols in some clouds and then we don't really know what happens. And the issue is like the monsoon is the most famous one. The monsoon system, very complex system, important for two billion people and it can be affected. I mean, that's clear. I mean, certain, if, if this goes wrong, then the monsoon is gone and wherever, yeah. So democracy is very important. So this is a standard United Nations General Assembly, is one approach, <laughs> probably difficult. And then there are all these other players, some of these you have seen before. So what does it mean? I mean, democracy. I mean, so what does it mean for, like Donald Trump, democratic elected, but if America does it alone, is it democratic? Then Facebook, I mean, to what extent is Mark Zuckerberg and all the other billionaires are the democratic elected? Not really. Uh, then we have also others. I mean, some people say, well, let's bring in the NGOs. They also have problems and challenges of democracy in a sense because they're also not elected in a way. The, the, the litmus is also debatable. Uh, yeah, the Catholic Church, I mean, the Pope was very big in the news after uh, they, he said uh, climate change is an important issue, but it's also maybe not the most democratically elected uh, actor. And then, in, in a way, it would be then these people, the famous faceless bureaucrats, I mean, don't support this claim in a sense, but it would be done by technocrats in a sense. You would have people and they would have lots of arguments and research and then somehow in these networks, somehow we would have decisions in this field. So how could we make it more democratic? There are lots of discussions about, I mean, one of the long ideas to have parliamentarian assemblies for this. I mean, to say, we don't leave it to the bureaucrats, we don't leave it to, to Mark Zuckerberg, we leave it to a democratic process in the terms of a kind of a parliament. And that it is about to have a world parliament, parliamentarian assembly, a bit modeled on the European parliament, which kind of works. So, but then the problems are also, how do you deal with it, global diversity? I mean, who is sitting in a global parliament? We have a European parliament where we have developed over the last 30 years some systems to deal with it, but how could we do this at the global level? There are books out there, there are lots of proposals on how to vote and how to organize it, but it's not really easy and not really fully uh, agreed upon how to do it. The other proposals would be to bring in civil society and all kind of actors uh, in a way that you have NGOs in the table and, and business maybe also and all kind of different uh, uh, civil society actors. But again, it's very difficult. There are tremendous power differentials between big NGOs and small NGOs, different interests, how do you really bring it all together uh, in, in, in a global process is, is, is very, very difficult. And we have also lots of studies that have analyzed biases and uh, power relationships and dominance within civil society. So to bring this in a decision-making procedure for geoengineering is not easy, to put it mildly. And there the third range of proposals comes from the theory of deliberative democracy that just says we do it without representation in a formal sense, but create deliberative spaces. 
Like uh, there's one proposal, a friend of mine, John Dreisig, he just said, we have a global deliberative assembly that is based on random selection. So you have a couple of people on a lottery and they all get together, who others say, let's do it by internet democracy. I mean, that kind of bring it in the voices of the people by online meets e-democracy. It has a little bit been done in United Nations networks. We have done studies on that, uh, which show, unfortunately, also that these democratic e-democracy procedures in the UN system are tremendously biased in favor of Anglophone countries and OECD countries. I mean, we did one study of one particular e-voting procedure where 75% of all the votes, so to speak, came from four countries only. And this was then Canada, Australia, etc. It's kind of not really the way forward. I mean, you have to create procedures by which also the poor countries, those that have no internet, that have no access, that have little information, can play a role and have a voice. And this is not easy. So my proposition for would be that it's actually difficult. I mean, democratic global governance of fundamental intentional interventions, global climate system, is hardly possible within the current system of global decision making. Implementation and also control, that's very important, of course, that once some actor is doing something, we have to also control this. Uh, also in terms of reversibility, it was also mentioned, you have to go back and we don't really know how to do this. Uh, and it would require a new way of global legitimacy and global decision making that we do not have right now. So it's kind of not that easy. So therefore, I mean, I would say, in what could the Dutch do in a sense? I, kind of, I mean, I think, I mean, putting up the Dutch government there together with the European flag, because it also makes more sense to do them in the European context. So I would say number one is take action. So take action. First, first of all, I would say, Mark Rutte, etc., et al., please organize an opinion. Switzerland has one. Switzerland is not uh, kind of actually small in the Netherlands, in a sense. Uh, they took initiative. They went to the United Nations in Nairobi. There was the United Nations Environment Assembly in Switzerland, got a couple of countries together and said, let's bring in a resolution to have a research uh, discussion and governance of these issues. Switzerland did it. Netherlands had nothing to say on that particular matter. So I would say, get action, bring this into the United Nations, get the best diplomats in the first row, and try to discuss it and say, we have to talk about what we actually want to do in these matters. And then I would also say we should have a research moratorium until we have more certainty about the governance. We should not really engage in a lot of research, and especially not into field experiments, without really having resolved the first order question, how do we actually want to deal with these issues, suppose they work out. And technically, and this is also what Herman kind of said, is they are not that difficult. I mean, it's not fully understood, the knowledge out there, but especially the solar radiation management is not rocket science. It's not, I mean, we have been put people on the moon, so the radiation management is easier. And it's not killing the expensive. You don't technically need everybody. I mean, America could do it alone. China could do it alone. Mark Zuckerberg could do it alone. So it's kind of what it is. So I mean, if the Pinatubo in Indonesia can do it, then Indonesia could do it all the time. It's kind of clearly a case for possibilities for unilateral action. So I would say that we have to really uh, uh, get a grip on these developments that not the scientist community and some countries or the G7 or the G20 or something is running away before we have a global agreement on the governance structures that are there. And then eventually I think we need to have a regulatory authority in the United Nations system, something like that. And this is what we do in the Netherlands. So if somebody in the Netherlands, here in Twente, would have a very funky, dangerous idea, then you would have to get a permission from Den Haag. I mean, that's what you do. There's a kind of legal procedures, and at some point you would get a fair or something like that, whatever that you can do or not do whatever you want to do. That's how the system is functioning. We need to have a, a global authority that can uh, agree or forbid, in a sense, certain of uh, ideas that come out. And then one can think about also there are lots of legally, institutionally other mechanisms there are inter uh, multilateral environmental agreements, climate convention, biodiversity convention, they could also take action. This has partially also been done. And there's even the United Nations Security Council, and this is really kind of the drastic level, but technically the Security Council is there to protect the world from, from crazy ideas, to put it this way. And I would say if some countries unilaterally go for geoengineering without consultation of the rest of the world, and we never know what happens in 2050, actually, when these things are really galloping, because we have now the 10 years to fix it, but if we do not use this 10 years, 
in 10, 20, 30 years, we might have really an extremely conflictive situation where some countries just say we do it. And then, I think these are some mechanisms that are there, International Court of Justice maybe, and I think also we need to have some self-regulation of the scientific networks. That we should really also have in the scientific community stronger discussions of what we want to do and especially also whom to involve. I mean, whom to involve, especially from the global south, to deal with these issues. But the core point would be, and I have published this also in the Volkskrank at one point, where I just said, Netherlands should start a discussion, just talk about it, because the time of just ignoring it and say we'll all be fine in the end, this is too late. Because the good news is, of course, to end it on a positive note, in the sense, this is my last slide, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, that actually we have still time. So if you are sufficiently shocked by geoengineering, it's not too late. We do not have to engage in all the technologies right now, because technically there is enough time to limit emissions uh, in, in some form. Uh, and also this is what a quote of Ban Ki-moon, which I like because he said this year 2015, that's when the quote is from. This is where the Paris Agreement was signed, we got the Sustainable Development Goals. So he said this is now, the agenda is on the table. Uh, and we have enough time to get together and to fix all the issues that we do not have in 2050. Uh, have a debate on geoengineering. Good. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for your. Thank you very much for your passionate talk. It's, it made it even more complex the whole uh, discussion, but that's that's very good to realize. Um, we have time for one question and then we go to Patrick's story and then afterwards we still have some, some questions uh, for you. Who wants to ask a question to Frank uh, Biermann? Yes, I have someone over here. Go ahead. Are you actually pleading for your first agreement should be a moratorium on the research? But mm -hmm. wouldn't that stop lots of developing things? which you need. Yeah, Frank, could you comment a bit Well, the argument that is that uh, research moratorium until governance structures are in place. So this would be like a regulatory authority that can take an informed decision with the consent of a large part of the global community or countries, for example, uh, and that we should not engage in this research. It's the same like with any other dangerous technology. You need to have a permission by the community is what you do on a local level, on a global level is the same, before you are engaging in research that can lead to great harm if deployed, if something goes wrong to all the world. So this is kind of, it's very controversial, I know, but we do it also, we have restrictions on research, like human genome, for example, there are certain restrictions of research where certain activities are not acceptable because we think they are very dangerous. And here in particular, I think, uh, because there's this tremendous imbalance between those countries that can do research and those countries that are most likely to <coughs> suffer either way, either by climate change or by, by, by geoengineering if it goes wrong, that unless you have procedures that especially the Global South has a clear and effective uh, control about these, the deployment of these technologies, uh, unless th we should kind of have a certain moratorium on these issues. And it has been done for, for uh, um, ocean fertilization. Uh, it was a couple of years ago where the G Convention of Biological Diversity has said we stop this, not forever, but at least till we really kind of have, have more certainty about the impacts of these issues. Mm. So I mean, I don't want to ban research, but I think it's very, very important that, uh, because once you have technologies in place, they might be used. I mean, so it's kind of, uh, we have to really debate these issues before, what kind of directions to go in a global process, no? in a democratic process. That's kind of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Frank, thank sure. you once more. Thank you. A big hand for Frank. And <laughs> Patrick, you're next. You're wired. And Can you're people hear me? Can people hear you? Just uh, go ahead. Uh, so I don't have anything that's quite as uh, that's quite as formally prepared. I think in part because from the philosophical perspective, it's sort of what our job is to kind of take what people are doing in other disciplines and sort of then try to and then try to unearth some of the assumptions and presuppositions that are involved and ask whether they're the right presuppositions and they're the, are they the right assumptions. Um, and of course, I have some things to say about the ethics of geoengineering. Although I think Frank and I are going to agree 
on a fair amount of this since my, uh, my background is, is I'm a political philosopher and I work on global and intergenerational justice and I work now primarily sort of emerging climate technologies and so I, the, the dramatic inequalities that exist within uh, geoengineering research are things that I've talked about and I sort of say for one, one way to avoid, um, uh, one of the ways to, a uh, necessary condition for the rightfulness of geoengineering research is the development of these independent research capacities for people in the global south because um, we want to make sure that uh, these individual, the, the perspectives of people in the global south are taken seriously in the context of these research agendas and that's very hard to do if it's just a sort of one-sided sharing of information. But uh, I'm going to talk with some, I'm going to start with I think a very basic fact and I think something that needs to be uh, emphasized in these discussions, and I think is often sort of, we haven't sort of run past it a little bit, which is that geoengineering understood as a social technical system that can reliably generate geoengineering outcomes does not exist, right? So it is a speculative technology, right? Um, we, have some, we have some ideas. Um, and some of them seem pretty plausible, but right now, I mean, even we're talking about Harvard's research, the Scopex research, is just them taking a balloon and dropping some water droplets in the upper atmosphere to see how things get distributed in various things. Like, we are, we are very, very far away from any kind of deployable technology, yet a lot of time, a lot of the time we have this conversation, well, solar radiation management will do this, or we can do this with negative emissions technology. And so there's a lot of things, and what we are is there's a worry here across the board that we are putting our eggs in various baskets in which there is, in which there is at the center of all these interventions uh, a black box, right, that is left speculative. Now, and so this is my, sec my other sec major point about geoengineering is that a lot of times geoengineering is held to standards that the other kinds of responses to climate change are not held to, right? So um, when we talk about this, uh, so for example, it is true that uh, when it comes to direct air capture or solar radiation management, we have some guesses, but it's still a speculative technology. But it's also true that most of the mitigation models we have rely upon technological developments that do not yet exist, right? So we are assuming advances in electrification, in uh, energy transmission, in energy storage that do not yet exist. We do not know how to do them. We have some ideas, we have some guesses, but we don't know how to do it. Well, we don't know how to do it. Same thing with um, climate engineering responses that re that require large scale, um, uh, large scale uh, uh, lifestyle changes. So we are asking people to engage in lifestyle changes that would be historically unprecedented, right? As a systematic change in our behavior, and we don't know how to. And again, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to make people reliably change their lifestyles in order to in a, adopt lower welfare, or as, I, as they perceive it, uh, in the name of a diffuse, um, a diffuse uh, problem that will cause damage to people around the globe for hundreds of years. Like that requires a sort of an understanding of human psychology and our ability to politically intervene upon them that we don't yet, net, that we don't yet have. Adapting to large scale climate impacts will require all kinds of interventions into our societies that again, we don't yet know how to do, right? And what are gonna be the, how, how, are we gonna, how are we going to go about say governing mitigation, right? We're talking about massive changes into our society, or massive changes into our society that, uh, that need to be governed in a way to generate equitable outcomes that are also going to be effective in mitigation. We're talking about remaking the global economic structure right, in the name of producing a decarbonized economy that will affect literally every economic and social relationship around the planet. And we're talking, and, and, then, we say, and then there's this idea, well, geoengineering is a really hard governance problem. Now, this is not fair, but, but what I'm sort of saying is that this is not a reason to not mitigate, right? And it's, uh, but it is a reason to talk about what I think is the central issue of climate ethics, which is that we have created a problem, right? And I mean we as in mostly people like us in this room, right? We have created a problem in which responding to it involves us taking very large risks. There's now nothing we can do about it, right? The era where we could have prevented climate change and avoided these sorts of questions is now gone. So for me, the main ethical issue 
when it comes to cli- when it comes to uh, when it comes to climate change, and then therefore geoengineering is what kind of risks are acceptable, right? And how are we going to distribute these risks? And 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 I think that and I want to say and I, I want to avoid the idea. I want to avoid the idea that geoengineering is, and I, I'm not saying, I want to avoid the idea that geoengineering is the only risky intervention, but it has in risks of a particular type, whereas mitigation and adaptation and other kinds of responses have risks of different types. And so I think that that's what I would want to say, what I want to pull apart here is that, and I think I want to underline the underlying ethical problem. And I think I want, I just, I want us to think very seriously about the injustice of what we have all done. All right, I want us to think, especially those of us in the global north, I want us to think really hard. We have, in the name of enriching ourselves, and I'm guilty, don't, I'm not, you know, it's my fault as much as anyone else's, maybe more. Um, so we are guilty of creating a public policy problem in which people are going to suffer, right, in which people are going to suffer in the name of benefiting ourselves. And in order for us to make it, in order for us to try and reduce that suffering, we're going to have to rely on some social technical system that is, as of right now, completely untested. And I think when you think about that, if you were to think about that in the abstract, that is such an extreme, uh, 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 extreme injustice. And this leads me to the next question about geoengineering. And so I agree with Frank very much on the discussions about global governance. And I would, I, and I very much, and so I don't, I was kind of worried I wouldn't have anything to say because I agree on the idea about, on the challenges of democratic global governance and the need for democratic global governance. But I'm going to then talk about this next step, right? Which is that, well, it's not going to happen. Uh, or let's say it's not going to happen. So uh, Frank uh, is describing a case of what in philosophy we would call ideal, or you know, pretty close to ideal uh, theory. Uh, but there's another. But we might ask ourselves, okay, so if this governance system, which would be an unprecedented in our, in our uh, unprecedented, as, we, as Frank is very, very, very uh, fairly points out, right, which is that we don't know yet how to do any of this stuff. Well, let's say it's not forthcoming, and let's say that somebody is going to engage in unilateral geoengineering. Okay, let's say that that's what's going to happen, right? Uh, um, and let's say someone wants to do it. Who has the right to do this? All right, who has the right to do this? So we're in a non-ideal circumstances. We are responding to a severe injustice, right? An injustice that's partly generated by this severe global inequality. So we're going to. Resp- so how do we respond? And not only that, but not only is there the injustice of us causing the problem, there's the secondary injustice of us not adequately responding to the problem. So who gets to do the unilateral geoengineering in that context? Well, I would suggest, and this is where we sort of talked about. Uh, I was talking about what to talk about. I was talking about responsibility, right? And so I was thinking about. Well, it seems to me. It seems to me that the people who are primarily responsible that are primarily responsible for uh, the injustice don't get to get out of the problem by unilaterally geoengineering themselves. Right? And so this is a sort of like, I have set someone's house on fire. I don't want to use my hose and fire extinguisher to put it out. So I start like, I don't know, I start like, like bombing, I started trying to create a firewall around the house by like, you know, bombing other houses and things like that. Now again, that's better because if the, house, because if the fire spreads to the other houses, you're going to have a conflagration. Uh, you know, you're going to have a, you're going to have a massive firestorm. So maybe it's better to create, maybe it's better to create um, this fire, uh, you know, this fire break around the house by bombing other people, by, you know, by bulldozing and bombing other people's houses. But it seems very weird to say that I get to do this, right? Because I'm the one that set the fire, and then I'm the one that says we can't use my fire extinguisher to put it out, right? So if that's the case, it seems weird to then say I can engage in this very risky behavior, in this very risky behavior, um, in order to prevent it, right? It seems like it seems like my responsibility for the injustice, my responsibility for injustice, has obviated my claim to be able to advocate or to be able to, to initiate this policy, even if it's true that this policy would produce better outcomes in the long run. Because I, don't, I no longer have standing to make the call, to make that decision. 
And my, and this is sort of, in some ways I want to advocate a more even, so a somewhat even riskier and more radical kind of idea, which is not just that we need independent, it's not, not just that we need independent um, scientific capacity for the Global South, which I very much agree to. I want to make, I kind of want to make the argument that the Global South actually has a revolutionary claim to engage in unilateral geoengineering without this governance if the governance isn't forthcoming. Right. You might even call it sort of an act of self-defense, right? because the Global South, or at least the countries of the Global South that are not responsible for climate change primarily and are going to suffer the most severe negative impacts are, and you might say, are subject to a kind of attack. Right? So a kind of attack. So there's a, there's a sense here, and so there's a sense here in which geoengineering can represent an act of self-defense to the people of the Maldives or Bangladesh or Kenya, right? Countries that are not responsible for climate change, uh, are not responsible for climate change, but they are themselves gonna suffer the worst impacts. So I have a paper that's about this that was just recently released. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea, the idea here is that if it is the case that these sorts of, if it's so, geoengineering is extremely risky and it's very, and, the re, and it's risky and that's why we need this global governance. We didn't need this global governance in order to do it in the ideal fashion. But if the global governance regime is not forthcoming, this gives rise to the question of who gets to do it then? And my idea is that the United States and Germany and the United Kingdom don't get to say, well, gosh, the mitigation adaptation would be really expensive and difficult. So I guess we're going to do some geoengineering instead, right? Because it would help the global poor. Right? Because it would stop all these climate impacts. No, you've already set the house on fire. It's no longer your call. Right? It's no longer your call. So that, so for me, this is one of the main issue, one of the main ethical issues about uh, one of the main ethical issues surrounding solar radiation management, other kinds of uh, other sort of more radical ki uh, kinds of geoengineering, including maybe ocean, iron ocean fertilization. Which is that it seems pretty clear to me that from an ideal perspective, Frank's account is exactly correct. Right? Uh, given the large scale inequality in power and wealth, it's very important that we have democratic global institutions in order to make good decisions about the uh, about the tinkering around uh, the tinkering with the planet. But if it's not for, but for me, the interesting ethical question comes with the next step, which is we're now 20 years down the, uh, down, the, uh, down the line. We've made some progress towards mitigation and adaptation, but we haven't made, much, we haven't made adequate progress towards govern governance, and some very severe climate impacts are coming down the pipeline towards, uh, especially, in particular, the global south. And so what are the ethical requirements there, especially because solar radiation management is well, again, here I am doing again, pretending like, like we've, we already know what solar radiation management can do. I'm doing it just like everybody else. But, but, solar radiation management, but solar radiation management is the kind of intervention that can operate with the speed, uh, okay, that can operate with the speed and generate the large-scale global impacts in order, to in order to potentially prevent some of these more severe impacts in time, right? So, for me, the interesting ethical question is, what happens when we find ourselves in that circumstance? And, of course, there's an additional ethical issue which is that by talking about this scenario, do we make it more likely that we're going to bring it about? Right? So if everyone's, sort of, if everyone's in the back of this, is, so we've talked to mention this a little bit, which is the, the ethical issue of mitigation obstruction. So this is the idea that if we keep geoengineering in our back pocket as a potential tool to respond to negative climate impacts, then is that mean that, does that mean that people are not going to take their mitigation obligations seriously? Now, of course, we think that that would be, of course, that would probably be irrational because solar radiation management, for example, can't fully compensate for all the negative impacts, uh, for all negative climate impacts. So, for example, just real quick, solar radiation management can't do anything about ocean acidification, which is one of the major negative impacts of climate change. There are other, interve there are other geoengineering interventions that might be able to do so, but solar radiation management can't do anything about ocean acidification. So we can't perfectly, it's not like geoengineering just turns down all the climate impacts. It's, it's, a, it's, a, more, it's a much more complicated compensation. So what does that mean? Uh, so, that mean so that means obviously it would be irrational to refuse to do mitigation because solar radiation management is available, but just because it's irrational doesn't mean it's not going to happen. 
right? <laughs> so, um, and so again, we have, so we have to deal with mitigation obstruction and various things like that. So I, one, there's an ethical issue of what, what is our responsibility as, uh, what is our responsibility in even talking about geoengineering? Now, as, as, it can, as I think you can tell me, I don't find the mitigation obstruction worry to be particularly uh, significant. Actually, there's some evidence that there's a reverse effect, which is that talking about geoengineering shocks people into thinking that climate change is serious. So, it's a, so there's some, there's some, psychological, there's some survey data that indicates that when you tell people about geoengineering, people are like, oh yeah, I didn't care that much about climate change. And then you tell them about geoengineering and they're like, oh my God, you're thinking about doing this? So climate change must be really serious. And you're like, you're like, people are weird, man. I don't know, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, so for me, for me, one of the main ethical issues about geoengineering is the the question of standing, right? And responsibility, there's claims of responsibility are very much tied up in claims of standing, right? So, um, I don't. Has anyone ever? Have you ever been? Um, has anyone ever been wronged by somebody? Raise your hand if you feel like you've been wronged. Everyone should be raising their hand. Hasn't everyone been wronged? Okay, everyone's been wronged. Okay. And you, and, and you're like, and you, and this person, and this person, and you feel resentment towards this person. Like you, you're, you, you feel angry towards them. You respond to them. And then you, and then somebody comes in, a third party. Maybe that person's your friend. You're like, and you maybe, you maybe decide, I'm thinking about forgiving this person or something like that. And this third person comes in and says, and says, hey, to, don't, you know, you did something wrong to my friend. And you're like, well, Okay, you know, but sometimes, and so, and they, they like, I, you know, and they like take responsibility for the wrongness that you've just experienced. Like they come in and they're like, I'm going to resent this person for you, right? You know, and you're like, and sometimes that's okay, right? Sometimes you need support, but sometimes you kind of want to say, well, who are you? to resent this person. Like, I'm deciding whether I'm gonna resent this person or forgive them. It's not up to you to tell me what the right response is, right? You know, and now, what if they come in, what if, and then here's the other thing. What if that person comes and says, oh, we forgive you? <laughs> and you're like, we forgive you? Who, who is we, right? And so, and so what I, one, of the, one of the very interesting things, and this is what I mean, is that in our day-to-day -day lives, a lot of times we're dealing with responsibility. We're trying to say whose fault it is or who, whether they have, someone has an excuse or a justification. But one of the things I think is really interesting about responsibility is the way when we think people have standing to complain. And I think with climate change, it creates a very interesting scenario about this. Like, who has stand? So my so my question, to a certain extent, is if we're in this non-ideal condition where climate change is still happening, we've made some progress, but not enough, and we've made some progress towards um, global governance, but it isn't fully democratized. Does the global north have standing to complain when other countries decide to do things that are perhaps reckless? You might say it's no longer, we've lost our standing to complain in that context. But again, there's something tricky about that, right? There's something tricky about that because not all of us in the global north are equally responsible for climate change. So there's that some people have a complaint and other people don't or something like that. So I think that this is where we talk about responsibility. When we talk about responsibility, we need to sort of engage in this idea of the complicated way in which various populations, various populations um, have different kinds of standing with one another, right? So local elites in the global south, right, especially uh, you know, might have different standing than the, glo than the poor of the global south. And some people and the marginalized populations of the global north might have more in common with in terms of standing with people in the global south, right? So again, there's all kinds of complicated relational judgments about who can complain about what kinds of injustices that I think get really complicated with climate change. And I'll just leave one last possible responsibility question. Then I'm going to say one thing about carbon dioxide removal and then I'll stop. But um, is that, now imagine the complicated judgments about responsibility, like let's say someone does geoengineering. And we know that geoengineering can affect the distribution of precipitation within a system. Right, and then um, so somebody decides to geoengineer. Let's say it's uh, Bangladesh decides to geoengineer. Okay, 
And then there is a drought in Central Africa. Now we know we know solar radiation management can affect precipitation patterns, right? But who's responsible and who has standing to complain and who has the standing, who has the standing to intervene in that particular context, right? In that, in that particular context, because maybe the solar radiation management is causing the precipitation problem, but even if it is causing it, which we don't know, Right, because we can't, we can't assign a specific precipitation event to the solar radiation management. But even if it was the case that it was being caused, that was, even if it was the case that this drought was being caused by solar radiation management in some important sense, it's only causing it in combination with the climate change that's been primarily imposed by the rich nations of the world. So who's responsible? Who has standing to complain? And who has standing to intervene? in those cases. Now, you, you, you say, if you're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know either, right? I have no idea, you know? I don't know either. I'm the philosopher. Uh, luckily, I'm not the governance guy. I don't have to come up with solutions. I just have to ask the questions, right? <laughs> All right? Okay? But I'm saying that, and again, and what I would say, moral responsibility in our day-to-day -day lives with our friends, our family, it's a, it, it's, these things seem simple, but then when we start, about, start talking about how these concepts operate within these large-scale systems where we can't assign easy causal contributions, these basic concepts that seem to govern our moral lives seem to break down a little bit. So, what we need, so one thing I'm calling for is for new concepts of responsibility that are, uh, that are more appropriate to this more complicated world. All right, and so that's, that's, the, that's the, the, my big thing about responsibility. I have one thing about carbon dioxide removal, and then I'll say it. So one thing that's about negative emissions technology that I want to say, and I think it's, it's, it's definitely true that negative emissions technologies have become a lot more prominent and mainstream than solar, radi than solar radiation management technologies. Something like 88% of the uh, integrated assessment models in the IPCC rely upon some amount of negative emissions technology. But the way they rely on negative emissions technology is this. It's, it's called the, uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 what happens is, is that we actually, um, we overshoot. It's the overshoot model of how to achieve our emissions uh, targets. So what does it mean? What does the overshoot model mean? Well, what it means is that, let's say our carbon budget is 800 billion tons, is 800 billion tons. Well, what we end up doing is we end up emitting 1.2 trillion tons right, over the uh, 1.2 trillion tons, we go, past our, we go past our target, and then there's going to be a series of years where because of negative emissions technologies, our emissions are negative, and we pull back. So we actually go, we emit too much, and then there's a series of years where we actually emit a negative amount, and we pull back, and we make our target. So let's say we have to make our, hit our target by 2100, 2100, we actually blow by our target at 2080, and then we spend 20 years pulling back. So this is the overshoot model, okay? The negative emissions technologies allow us to emit too much, and then we pull back. But there's a problem here, right? Which is that some impacts of climate change, some impacts of climate change, you cannot unring the bell. <coughs> right? So, we, so, we're, so what, we've, what we, the assumption here is that impacts directly correlate, you know, sort of in a sense correlate with our overall budget. But that's not quite true, because let's say that we go, we go past our budget, we have additional warming, and there's some melting of the ice caps, and then we pull back. It's not after we pull back, all of a sudden the ice caps go back, right? So the overshoot model, this is important, overshoot model assumes that there's ways of compensating, ways of compensating for those kinds of impacts that are irreversible. And that involves a judgment of value commensurability, that we can give you some value that will make up for, the, uh, will make up for this other value that you've lost, that we can compensate you for it. And that's an ethical assumption of these models that are based upon their economic nature, right? Which is that because, we, oh, well, you know, we can compensate you with money because everything can ultimately be reduced down to a monetary value. And that's an ethical assumption that I think we need to challenge with, the carbon di with, 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 the, with these carbon dioxide removal strategies is that right now we are operating on these assumptions where there's going to be irre irreversible climate impacts 
that we're eventually going to have to compensate for. And I think that generates its own kind of unique ethical concern about how, how is it the case, what is, comp, uh, what is compensable, what can be compensated for, and what can't be compensated for. So I don't know how long that was. I, so anyway, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, for raising these very interesting philosophical uh, dilemmas. Perhaps, Frank and uh, Herman, you could also come on the stage and turn your mics on. Um, uh, Frank, I was, I was wondering, um, uh, Patrick talked about a new type of responsibility. You talked about a new type of, of governance. H how do you, could you comment on his new type of responsibility? Can you well, I mean, I very much like this idea about standing, and especially, I mean, mm -hmm. geoengineering as a potential act of self-defense for the Global South. <laughs> and this is a scenario that is not really big in the debates, but it's not to be ruled out. There are some countries that have not been responsible for these issues. Maldives, you have mentioned, Bangladesh and others. There are actually papers also. There's a paper that was authored by people from Bangladesh and other places that had warned against the paternalism of the NGOs in the north. It says, mm. you don't tell us what we have to do. We want to discuss ourselves whether geoengineering is the way forward or not. So theoretically, you can really imagine at some point that least developed countries with Harvard's science and Bill Gates' money doing this together without asking anybody in the OECD world. It's perfectly possible. And I agree that this could be a, um, a, an act of self-defense. I would be careful because of the uncertainties in all these models and especially the, um, the, the differences in, in cooling. So it's not like a, the thermal start that you have in your house where you could have, so you have overcooling, undercooling, all kind of impacts on precipitation. And it's here where the global, where, where especially African countries are especially vulnerable. Uh, because in their, because they're so dependent on agriculture in a way, and they have also some <coughs> quite complicated <laughs> ecological system in sense, they are so vulnerable to changes. If something goes wrong, that I would not advise them to go forward in it. But philosophically mm -hmm. and politically, this is perfectly possible. It's an act of self-defense. So take the science from Harvard in this case, because they do this field of management, mm -hmm. take the money of Bill Gates and just go for it and mm -hmm. say goodbye OECD, we fix it ourselves. Now you mm -hmm. messed it up, Holland and all the others. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> kind of. And yeah, I yeah. mean, <laughs> it's not an unlikely scenario. I want to at one point, Edward, not mention intergenerational, because there's some younger people here I see in the audience. It's kind of also very much an intergenerational mm -hmm. issue. Because some of us, including myself, I mean, I'm not kind of middle-aged forever, <laughs> I don't know, so, but I mean, it's not necessarily the issue, no? but for many people who are now in their 20s, in a sense, I mean, you guys have lived this through for maybe ever like uh, life expectancies, 88 years, or these kind of things, no? so it's really your planet, in a sense. So these are really discussions that the young people have to have. Mm -hmm. Because the issue is there, and the issue is a generational issue. I mean, how do you want to have your planet mm -hmm. in the second half of the century? Good luck with that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe the young people want to respond to it, but first I go to <laughs> to you, Hua. Well, let me keep it brief then. Um, I I don't buy that. I, I felt that all the way through through Patrick's talk. So you have people uh, locally optimizing because they can. They live in a situation where they have these. Uh, uh, they're surrounded by these capabilities. They take use of them. Yes. You call it guilt. But I don't buy that. That's not guilt. That's human nature. And the people living elsewhere who don't have that, ab that ability still have that human nature. They would if they could. And that's not, th that's not taking away my responsibility. But it is, I don't buy the guilt part. And because I don't buy the guilt part, I don't buy that I don't get to be involved in the discussion how to solve the issues that I don't feel a guilt towards having caused. Can I ask you a question? You say you don't buy the guilt part. Is it you don't buy it or you don't want to buy it? <laughs> well, both, obviously. Yeah, well, no, but, that, but that's the critical point. I mean, I think the whole issue here is that we, we, only start, we have to acknowledge the problem first. And that's the difficult part. So realize and, and recognize there's a problem, and it's a problem made by mankind. And the part of mankind... <laughs> you know, but, the, the, but the part of mankind who's done this is yeah, the Western world. Yeah, so that, I that's where the guilt comes in. 
So I want to be careful. But guilt as a moral issue, I, I that is the one I'm arguing yeah. against. So, so I want so the, I, the, the responsibility I don't want to argue against. But I, okay. I think I so so I uh, so I, so I want I want us to be kind of careful here. And I think what you're getting at to a certain extent is this worry about the breakdown. So so is it the case? So is it the case that you that we have individual moral responsibility for? Um, these climate impacts in, some, in the same way that if I accidentally step on someone's <laughs> foot and I say I'm sorry, I have individual moral responsibility for the act that I did. Well, probably, probably not that way, right? So this is what, so um, it has to be, it, it, whatever the nature of the responsibility, and I mean the moral responsibility here, with the win that does generate a kind, that does generate a kind of uh, guilt claim, uh, is going to be a, is going to be a different kind of response, or is going to have is going to be responsibility that is worked out for a more complicated judgment. But I don't know if I want to say um, that just because um, this is a predictable consequence of human nature. So, so there's I and I kind of agree with you that there's a complicated. The responsibility judgment has to be more complicated than just the stepping on the foot case for a variety of reasons. But I don't want to say, but one thing I would want to resist is that just because something is a relatively predictable consequence of human nature, that you, can, that you shouldn't, that, it's, that it can't be wrong, or that you can't feel moral responsibility for it. I would resist that kind of claim pretty strongly, because it could just be the case, uh, for a variety of reasons. But I guess I would say that one reason is that, well, it could just be the case that it's a predictable thing that we're all doing something wrong, right? That could be true. Um, and some people don't do it, don't do it, and things like that. And so, but, but I would say, yes, you, what you're pointing at, which is that the nature of my responsibility has to kind of be mediated through certain political and social systems in a way that's quite different from me accidentally bumping into somebody on the street or something like that. I agree about that, and I think you're pointing out the way this stuff needs, we need to rethink our notions of responsibility for complex systems. But, but we can all be bad. Right. We can, yeah, everybody can do things and it still be wrong, I think. That's what I think. <laughs> okay, Patrick, thank you. We go to the final uh, question. Yeah, so I think um, all of you agree that we should try to avoid at least the necessity for geoengineering um, at any cost. And considering that and the injustice that is being caused, um, what is your take on nonviolent si uh, civil disobedience? <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's a nice question from the younger generation. Hermon, could you well, the comment on the violent part is always good. <laughs> so there's no, no doubt about this. And yeah, Maybe you can take this mic. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I find this a bit difficult. Um, because it's, uh, when you talk about non-violent civil disobedience, uh, you say, well, I, I don't care about the law, right? Yeah, that's what you say. Uh, but, the, but the problem here is that I see the, I see, I see the discussion that about non-civil or non-violent civil disobedience mainly in the Western world, and that's the risk because whatever we do over here is not so relevant anymore in terms of climate change. Uh, you talk about the global south, and as I show this graph that our impact is quite small. So we can do whatever we like over here and feel very good about it. So look how well I behave, but the impact is quite small here. I think it's much better for us to think about solutions that so with which we can help the rest of the world to combat climate change than do something here which might be good for ourselves and might make us feel good, but it's not so effective. So our CO2 emissions can go down to zero if we like. So if we say, well, forget about every law and we do whatever we want to do and we stop driving cars and we stop <laughs> flying and we stop eating meat and we do what, it will go to zero. But temperature will not change that much. Because our impact right now, our emissions of today here in Europe are not so significant anymore. But don't all those other countries follow our example? Mm, yes. Not um, in terms of lifestyle. Uh, because what yeah. you see, if, if, you, if you go to India, if you go to China, if you go to Indonesia, do you think that they want to become vegetarian? Well, all of them are going to come back to China. Yeah, but they, they will come. No, but if you look at India, it's a, it's a growing nation. Africa still has to start. South America still has to start. And they are looking at us. And they see, oh, look, this, this part in Europe, it looks like paradise to us. We want to have the same standard of living. But that's the standard, the, the standard of living we have today. Not the standard of living that we might have 20 years from now. They look at us today. 
And they want to go to, in our direction, you want to have our wealth and our standard of living. And we have to find ways to make this possible for them, not by lowering our standard of living, but by increasing their standard of living. That's the challenge that we have. That's why I don't believe that much. I think it's very good to have such discussions, but I don't think this is the solution. I think the solution should be think globally. Think of an impact we can have globally instead of locally. I just want to disagree. About it. I think it's important that you guys... Very, do very short, Frank. <laughs> Otherwise you won't I be... I mean, the Dutch average carbon dioxide emission is three times the global average. I think it's a moral responsibility of everybody, even the global... Of course, every one of you is one out of seven billion, so it is not the biggest impact. You won't fix it alone. But mm -hmm. the global model and also responsibility, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. So I will not kind of try to hinder anybody to do something for climate change right now in this country. Even though it's a, it's a small part, of course, but yeah, <laughs> it's a small country, what can you do? So, but it doesn't mean, and I think I very much believe in normative changes, in, in symbolism, in developing a new modernity that lives with much less emissions. And this can be driven even in a small country. Like in Sweden, for example, we know last year flight uh, traffic went down. And within one year, 8% of something like this it was, mm -hmm. it went down in one year. So this is the first country in the world that has less emissions by air traffic. Okay. Uh, it okay. works somehow. But you have only 10 years. So we, <laughs> we round off with a very big hand for these three uh, wonderful gentlemen. Thank you very much.